everybody, good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government. And joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, who is the Acting Health Officer, Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Sean O'Donnell and Ms. Kimberly Townsend from the Department of Health and Human Services. And today we have two special guests, Ms. Jody Finkelstein, who is Executive Director of the Montgomery County Commission for Women. And she's gonna be here today to talk about Domestic Violence Awareness Month, as well as Vinny DeMarco, President of Maryland Healthcare for All. And he will be talking about the work being done to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Reporters, use the chat during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for uh, joining with us. Uh, today I'm talking to you from Annapolis. I'm here attending a Maryland Association of Counties meeting of the Board of Directors. And I look forward to catching up with um, our folks around the state that we work with uh, a lot, particularly during the General Assembly session. And we'll be talking about the upcoming session, how legislation at the state will affect us and you know what, what kind of responses um, we wanna have to that legislation. Uh, MAKA is a great organization that does allow leaders from across the state to work on our shared challenges and discover solutions. Um, there's no uniform point of view up here. People do come from different perspectives, obviously from different parts of the state, but it's a good chance to work together. And I'm pleased to have Vinny DeMarco from Maryland Healthcare for All joining me today to update you on the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, a concept that actually became legislation that was supported by MAKA through bipartisan advocacy. Um, the Prescription Drug Affordability Forum uh, was held um, a couple days ago. The Prescription Drug Affordability Board is an independent unit of the state uh, that's tasked with protecting Marylanders and the Maryland healthcare system from the high cost of prescription drugs. This board is the first of its kind in the nation, but it's now being modeled and replicated in other states. I joined the Maryland Healthcare for All Coalition and AARP Maryland. Um, Hold on a second, this is, I need my tech person to assist me. That did exactly what I said I was gonna do, Scott, it obliterated uh, my notes, thank you. Uh, I joined the Maryland Healthcare for All Coalition and AARP Maryland at a community forum at Riderwood um, Retirement Community on Tuesday to update the public on their work and gather for feedback, more feedback from the challenges people face because of high drug costs. I think probably all of us who are listening, you know, know people who've been impacted. I know people who've been impacted who wind up um, having to pay far more for drugs than, than is affordable to them. I know somebody whose drug payment for one drug is almost equal to half of their social security retirement, and that's the extent of their retirement. Uh, so it's tough for a lot of people to manage health um, drug prices right now, healthcare in general, but drug prices for sure. It's hard to find anybody who's not impacted. 27% uh, of kids and teens between 12 and 19 years old reportedly use prescription drugs over the past 30 days, and that number increases to 47% for looking at adults 20 to 59, and over 85% for adults 60 and up. The tragedy is the less money you make, the more like you, likely you are to cut your pills in half or skip days on your medication in order to save money and make your medication go longer. That is not in the best health interest of the patient, but it reflects people's ability to pay for this. And it's really kind of sad that in you know, an industrialized country and you know wealthiest country in the world, we still haven't figured out how to make drugs affordable to the residents of this country. Uh, that's the corner that high drug prices have painted people into though, and it's a real thing. So how do we get out of it? How do we create a system that works for everyone so no one has to make these kind of tough choices? And I think tough is actually too mild a word. It's kind of an obscene choice to choose between rent, food, and the medicine you need. Um, we're having to make these choices. It's extraordinarily difficult for those people. And if they're in a family, it can be extraordinarily difficult for everybody else in the family. Uh, we believe relief will come once we as a state are able to negotiate with the drug companies on prices. One key aspect of the Inflation Reduction Act focuses on drug prices. 
The law grants Medicare the authority to negotiate with drug corporations for the first time in our country's history to negotiate um, the price of drugs. Not only will this make prescription drugs more affordable for all Americans on Medicare, but this will also provide our state's Prescription Drug Affordability Board with a blueprint for determining appropriate, appropriate upper payment levels to make high-cost drugs more affordable. Um, I'm going to turn this over now uh, to Vinny DeMarco, who's the president of Maryland Healthcare for All, who's going to go into more details. I just want to preface all that by saying Vinny's a remarkable person. He has been a champion for healthcare for Marylanders um, for as long as I've known him. I think I've worked with him for 25 years, going back to when I was on the city council in Tacoma Park, and I've always been happy to support the work he does because I know the work he does is in the best interest of the residents of this state. So thank you, Vinny, for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. County Executive, for having me here and for that uh, warm uh, introduction. And I also want to especially thank you for your leadership in getting enacted the first in the nation prescription drug affordability board uh, in 2019 here in Maryland. This was not easy. The drug corporations fought tooth and nail, brought in lobbyists from all around the world to fight this law. And uh, we got it passed because of people like County Executive Elridge and his colleagues all across the state who said enough is enough. Simply put, drugs don't work if people can't afford them. Drugs don't work if people can't afford them. And there are 25% of people who just say they can't afford their drugs. They have to choose uh, between drug, their, their critically necessary prescription drugs and, and food on the table or schooling for their kids or, or heat for their house. It really is unconscionable, as the county executive so eloquently said. The drug corporations say they need to have these high prices to fund their research, but we know they spend more on advertising than on research and other nations spend a lot less on prescription drugs than we do. So that's why uh, the, uh, it was so important for Maryland to take the lead with the Prescription Drug Affordability Board in 2019. And thank you again, County Executive Elridge, for your leadership, as you said so well at our forum in Riderwood uh, the other day, along with the health, health officer of uh, Prince George's County, uh, Ernest Carter, and wonderful uh, states uh, Senator from Montgomery County, Brian Feldman, and, and leader uh, in the House, uh, Delegate Bonnie Cullison. The two of them are two of our main leaders on this issue from here in Montgomery County. But the board was created in 2019. It's there in place now. It has five terrific members and a stakeholder council and a terrific executive director in Andrew York, Dr. Andrew York, who was at this forum also. And what the board has done is done a really in-depth analysis of what causes high-cost drugs to hurt uh, people in Montgomery County, Maryland, and frankly, the nation, and is in the process of developing a plan to make high-cost drugs more affordable for state and local governments. The 2019 law gave them this authority to put what we call upper payment limits on what state and local governments pay for high-cost drugs. We're going to have to come back for additional legislation to give them the authority to put up our payment limits on what all of us pay for high-cost drugs. But this is a very important step that we hope they will take soon to say, okay, whatever you want to charge around the country, um, drug corporation, for this particular drug, our state and local governments will only pay this reasonable amount. That will help everybody. That will help employees of state and local governments, that will help taxpayers, that will help all of us who benefit from the spendings of uh, state and local governments. So we're looking forward uh, to the board um, making this uh, making this progress. And as the county executive said, um, other states are following our lead. Nobody had done this before 2019. Colorado and Oregon have passed similar laws and other states are, are looking at it. And as the county executive said, we are thrilled about the Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation Reduction Act, which President Biden signed into law and, and, and with the support of virtually all the Maryland uh, House and Senate delegation, including, of course, uh, Jamie Raskin and David Trone from Montgomery County, and our senators Van Hollen and Cardin, worked hard to make this happen. 
And this law will, for the first time, give Medicare the authority to negotiate with drug prescription drug corporations, which will provide guideposts for our board, as the county executive said. And very importantly, put a $2,000 a month, a year, $2,000 a year cap on what people on Medicare pay for high-cost drugs. And many people on Medicare are paying a lot more. In addition, it will be for people on Medicare a $35 a month cap on what they pay for insulin, which we know a lot of people are having trouble affording their insulin. Thanks to uh, Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick, the new chair of the House Health and Government Operations Committee, we're putting a $30 per month cap here in Maryland beyond people on Medicare. So we have made a lot of progress at the federal and state level. There's more to do, and we look forward to working with uh, County Executive Eldridge and his colleagues to give the board the additional power it will need soon to make high-cost drugs more affordable for everyone. Thank you, Vinny. Um, I just want to bring this home with something, something that affects us very much in the real world. You know, we think about this as an individual issue, but you take Montgomery County. We, we have retirees. We pay their health care benefits. The county does. The school system does. We have companies in this country that they pay health benefits as part of their employment packages. They pay, you know, health benefits for retirees as well. And those costs have just soared out of sight. And so it doesn't just become a pain for the person who ultimately has to pay, you know, these huge differentials. It's a real challenge for local governments and for businesses to keep trying to keep up with soaring costs that have no bearing on inflation. They have nothing at all to do with inflation. The drug costs don't suddenly go up by some of these remarkable percentages, like what happened with insulin, which was based on nothing other than somebody's uncontrolled greed. Um, that's, you know, let's be honest about this. And having controls on drug prices and the top end of drug prices is going to mean that our budgets will be a little bit saner. It'll free up money for us to do other things that are important to do in the community without having to go to taxes to do it. So we all have a stake in this. This isn't just about retirees and people on Medicare and Medicaid. In the end of the day, when this becomes the norm, it's something that's going to benefit every single Marylander and every single American. So I hope people think about this in the big picture because it does affect you because we do tax you. So moving on to other things. Uh, Mr. County Executive, can we open it up for a little bit oh, sure. from the members of the media just in case yeah. uh, they have any questions about this topic for Mr. DeMarco and or you. So members of the media, any questions regarding this particular topic? I'll give you a couple of seconds to let us know. Any questions about the work that has been done to bring down the cost of prescription drugs? Going once. Going twice. Okay, I guess we don't, we do move forward, Mr. County Executive. Thank you. Hold on just a second. Can I sign off? <laughs> We have a question. Okay. I think you can. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you very Betty. much. Bye bye. <clears throat> so, as I was about to say, October <laughs> is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And on Tuesday, I stood with the County Council and other public safety leaders in recognizing that the alarming number of domestic violence cases across Montgomery County continues to be a concern. Uh, one in four women and one in seven men are going to experience domestic violence in their lifetime. These numbers are unacceptable. Uh, we have to remain committed to reducing violence and creating ways to help victims and encourage prevention. This month, our libraries and rec centers are showcasing 65 walking in their shoes displays. These displays showcase how domestic violence impacts victims in so many ways. And I applaud those survivors who are willing to come forward and share their stories and their pain to help educate other people. Uh, other campaigns like Choose Respect target teenagers. A uh, recent teen forum in Wheaton was attended by nearly a thousand participants and learned about the importance of demanding respect from your um, partner relationship. Uh, there are also many programs and free resources available from the Family Justice Center in Rockville. Uh, the Family Justice Center can provide domestic violence victims with resources and support to leave an abusive relationship, including putting victims in touch with lawyers and professionals who can help file protective orders 
and the Family Justice Center is open Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. And welcomes, walk-ins are welcome. And I just want to acknowledge the work that um, Dutchie Trachtenberg did when Ike Leggett was the county executive uh, to make the Family Justice Center a reality and to provide safe places for people to come and get support. And it only ultimately has led to the creation of protected sites for transferring uh, children in custody from one adult to the other adult in order to assure that the transfer is safe for everybody involved. So we've done a lot of work on this and we're going to keep doing work on this. Um, the crisis services for victims of domestic violence are available 24-7 through our crisis center. And our crisis center phone number is 240-777-4000. And we're going to put that number in the chat and I urge you to report on and share on social media that number. We need to make sure every family and resident knows about this resource. These are the type of efforts that are going to make a difference. But we need the vigilance of all residents to look out after themselves and their loved ones, but also their neighbors. A lot of times people are in pain and they don't know who to go to, and they may be showing signs of depression or signs that something's wrong. If you feel like somebody is harboring something that's wrong, uh, encourage them to talk. Talk to you or talk to somebody who can help them. But the most important thing is nobody should have to tolerate and live in these kind of circumstances. If someone's abusing you, you need to be able to get out, and we need to help provide the means and the resources to facilitate your ability to get out. Nobody should have to stay in an abusive relationship because they're economically dependent on somebody. Uh, that should not be, and, you know, we want to help people as much as possible, make sure that they don't experience that. And we have to stop the silence on domestic violence. I'm glad to be joined today by Jody Finkelstein, the Executive Director of Montgomery County Commission for Women, and she's going to discuss more about Domestic Violence Awareness Month events, advocacy, and support for victims. So I'll turn this over to Jody now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive. Um, and thank you all for joining us today to talk about this exceptionally important topic. Um, as the County Executive said, yesterday was the kickoff to Domestic Violence Awareness Month which lasts the entire month of October. And while we know that we are only focusing it on this, this kind of education and outreach um, during this month, uh, domestic violence happens every day to all different kinds of people, not only in Montgomery County, um, but around our nation. I do want to emphasize that if you are a victim of domestic violence and you do need assistance, um, Montgomery County here uh, is here to help you. All of the services are for free, um, so please do not hesitate to call. Um, if you know somebody who might be a victim of domestic violence or perhaps you're in a relationship and you're not sure whether it's healthy or not, uh, please call. The commission is here to help. While we don't provide uh, uh, direct services, we do provide information and referral. Um, and I do want to also add that our commissioners are very much dedicated uh, to uh, eradicating domestic violence, um, as well as our chair, uh, Donna Rojas. Again, if you are a victim of domestic violence, please reach out for help. Nobody deserves to be abused, and, and we are here for you. If you would like to learn more about uh, domestic violence in Montgomery County, um, as the county executive said, there will be exhibits in and around the county in the libraries, in our courts, uh, and as well as in the rec centers that exhibit the stories of individuals who have been victims. And what you'll see are actual pair of shoes um, from someone who uh, may have been in a domestic violence relationship, but their stories that you will read are absolutely real. The fear that they um, experience are absolutely real. And that's why it's so important for um, people to reach out and why, that, why this, is, this month is so important. So again, the number uh, to reach out for assistance, if you're in immediate crisis, please dial 911. Um, and of course, if you need long-term or more long-term assistance, please call the crisis center at 240-777-4000. Thank you again, Mr. County Executive. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Heckelstein. Uh, members of the media, any questions regarding Domestic Violence Awareness Month at this time? We'll give you a second. Any questions for Ms. Finkelstein and or the county executive regarding this topic? Okay, Heather Curtis has raised a hand. Good afternoon, Heather. 
Good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Finkelstein, I'm wondering if you have any idea, you know, how many people are victims of domestic violence in the county every year and how our county compares to others in terms of the incidence of domestic violence and also the services that are available? Um, sure, Heather, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact numbers in Montgomery County right now, but I'll, I'll see what I can do to get them to you. Um, and I, again, I, I wouldn't have those numbers as they compared to other counties, but I can tell you um, that the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence holds an annual vigil every year to remember those lost to, as a result of domestic violence. Um, in two, in uh, 2021, um, 58 Marylanders died as a result of domestic violence, five of whom were from Montgomery County. Is that it? Do you Thank have any you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Any other questions regarding this topic? All righty. Thank you, Mr. Finkelstein, for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we can move forward with a public health update. All right, so just a quick announcement. This week, um, we're honoring Montgomery County employees who provide customer service to our residents, businesses, and visitors, and we're doing this during National Customer Service Week. Uh, we appreciate the hard work that's done by our employees on behalf of the county, and we're focused on improving customer service efforts and experiences. It's frustrating to a constituent or a business to feel that the government doesn't care, doesn't value them, or doesn't respond to them, and our county innovation team has been working with our employees to kind of root out the inefficiencies in how things are operationalized inside of departments and also to reduce the red tape that can slow down our responses to your requests. Uh, from our 311 call takers to our permitting and procurement specialists to our libraries, recreation, and ABS staff, our employees and their managers are committed to treating everyone they serve with respect. And we hope that our residents take the opportunity this week to thank the county employees who's helped them during uh, customer service week. Uh, so now on to the COVID update. As for COVID, uh, we're seeing fewer COVID-19 cases right now based on both case rates and hospitalization numbers. Our community level status is in the low category. Our case rate of 84.71 per 100,000 residents is only slightly higher than we were this time last year. So we are higher than we were last year. We try to be a good indication this isn't exactly over. Um, this is good news, but we have to make um, sure that we, you know, remember how quickly it can turn dangerous and that when Omicron variants arrive, um, the impact and the surge had our hospital capacity on the edge. So we need to be sure that, you know, we, we stay current and we stay ahead of this. Um, you know, a lot of people are afraid that fewer cases and less nationwide focus on COVID were in danger of forgetting how dangerous this disease still is. And you certainly benefited from the vaccines in terms of lessening the severity and lessening the death toll. But this is still with us. And as we saw, you know, a new variant like Omicron was can pretty rapidly change um, how many people are getting sick and what the effects are. And I know I'm just reading, you know, in, I, um, study this morning that talked about, you know, real concerns over the next variants being more infectious and that if people don't get vaccinated and if they're not boosted, they're going to be losing some of the protection that mitigates against the more severe cases. And of course, everyone's, you know, concern is what happens when a variant comes along that doesn't respond to the vaccine. I think the good news is they understand the virus pretty well and what it looks like. Um, and hopefully we'll have enough time to develop uh, strategies um, before the virus takes a deep hold in the community or can cause more damage. But this requires all of us doing our job. And you know, one of the things the study said was that if 80% of Americans had been boosted or got boosted, the savings to the country would be in the billions of dollars. The savings you know, to Medicare alone would be billions of dollars. Um, it is, this is enormously expensive to deal with, even if people aren't dying. And so anything you do, not only can help protect your own personal financial situation, but it helps reduce the cost to all of us in terms of trying to contain this disease. I'm glad to see that we've seen an uptick in our booster rates over the past month, and many of our residents have gotten 
the new bivalent booster. This is the booster shot that's now available. We're not providing, and other people aren't providing the other booster shots. So the bivalent booster has protections on, against Omicron that weren't present in the booster that most of us had been taking over the last couple of years. So we're now seeing uh, more boosters administered per week since last January. So we're really glad that people are taking this seriously. And remember, if you miss booster shots, we're not, you can't go back, and we're not, so not asking you to go back and take the ones you missed. Take the one that's here right now because the one that's here right now will provide you with protection against the original version of COVID and its, and its variants, as well as the Omicron variant family. I'm pleased to say this county is 90% fully vaccinated and 60% of our residents are boosted. There are no counties of our size and diversity that have reached this level of vaccination, but these numbers really do need to continue to rise as we move into the fall. Uh, we know that you know when it gets cooler, we're all gonna be indoors more. And with the, with many people being indoors and not wearing masks, the, the chances of, you know, spreading this increase. So uh, we, we will alert you. Um, that's why we stay on top of this if we see upticks in cases. So when it gets to the point or if it gets to the point where you really need to go back to masking indoors as a rule rather than as a choice, uh, we'll let you know if we hit that point. Hopefully we don't. But I think everybody needs to just realize things are still possible, even with the new vaccine. And we just need to be aware that uh, we need to keep everybody informed about where we are. Right now, not so bad. Um, supply for the new booster is now more plentiful. The vaccine can be found easily at local pharmacies, as well as our health department. And I got my shot over at Giant in Silver Spring. Uh, please remember that if you don't have health insurance, the county run vaccine sites do not charge anyone for the vaccine. But we still recommend appointments to be sure you have the type of vaccine you're looking for, particularly if you're looking for first shots. Um, also, if the children are under 12, because we do not, this is not yet approved uh, for younger people. Uh, before I turn over to Dr. Bridgers or Dr. Stoddard and Sean Adal and Kimberly Townsend for their public health update, I want to comment yes, on yesterday's Fifth Circuit Court Appeals ruling against the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. There are approximately 10,000 residents in Montgomery County, including thousands in Maryland, and thousands in Montgomery County who arrived in this nation as children that could be impacted by this decision. For the vast majority of these individuals, known as dreamers, they know of no other country than this one. Five years ago, our nation finally provided them clarity and certainty about their immigration status through DACA. Now their legal status is once again could be in jeopardy. This is really unfair to them, and it's bad for this country. And it proves once again that conservatives in this country continue to be void of compassion or common sense. Um, we have educated these kids, and they have become a part of this community. And the idea that they would not be protected from deportation because they arrived here as children, as infants in some cases, undocumented, is just obscene. And I think people have to ask themselves, you know, what is going to happen to so many of our businesses and industries that have come to depend on immigrant workers? It is absolutely true. They play an integral role in this economy. And having been through school here, so many of them had the opportunity, and many of them are moving into you know, their first professional careers, they're in the workplace. Um, to take all this back makes no sense at all. Uh, it's not good for business, it's not good for community, and it's not good for the people who once more could be in fear um, of what could happen. This ruling won't change anything immediately. DACA recipients will keep their work status and protections from deportation until this court case is settled. At this point, the program is once again considered at risk. And that's why many advocates are stressing that it's time to fight for DACA again. The program has produced hundreds of thousands of college graduates who have careers and families. Citizen offers, offers citizenship offers the only permanent relief that will end these constant court battles and provide the dreamers with the certainty they deserve. And we're going to continue to support the work of advocates like CASA 
as we follow developments around DACA. Every member of our congressional delegation supports permanent protections, including a pathway to citizenship. We support the efforts to provide clarity for DREAMers as well as protections and reform for all our immigrant communities and new arrivals in the county. And having said this now, I'm going to turn this over to our public health officials for their updates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Brown. you, Mr. County Executive. Before we roll over to Mr. O'Donnell, I just wanted to um, echo um, what our County Executive has asked, not only with our um, uh, booster, getting our booster rates up, but we uh, had one of the highest percentage uh, uh, rates in the state last year for our uh, flu uh, vaccination campaign. And so we are again returning to that high level of responsive this and asking our residents and encouraging our residents to get a flu shot um, if it is applicable and they can get a flu shot. So in addition to uh, maintaining uh, uh, being current on their uh, COVID uh, vaccination, we also um, encourage highly strongly recommend um, because we know we're moving into our flu season. And so we want all to have the maximum protection. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mr. O'Donnell to provide uh, an update on our numbers. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Okay, so going in, I just want to, again, um, start by discussing uh, our continued surveillance of the variants. Uh, as we, as was mentioned, our transmission rates are coming down, uh, but we're continuing to monitor not only in our region, which is region three, but across the US and internationally, um, any new variants of note. Um, we are tracking on BF7, BA2.75. They're currently not making up um, a significant number of cases in our area, uh, but we're, we're keeping our eyes on them as potential newer variants. As our county executive shared, uh, we've seen our transmission rates come down. We now have had several days where we've been below 100 cases per 100,000. Um, again, this is sort of an arbitrary mark, but we, we appreciate seeing these numbers continue to come down. These, of course, are just uh, PCR tested results. We know there's, there's many more cases than this, but this provides us a good trend of where disease transmissions are going. Um, additionally, we continue to see our hospitalization numbers come down, which is very encouraging. Uh, as of earlier this week, we had 77 total individuals across the county with a COVID-19 diagnosis in our hospitals. Um, just a, a little bit less than half of that were at, had been transferred over to the alternate care site uh, for continued rehab um, and recovery. Looking at our, our case rates, as we mentioned, they've come down. Um, one thing we'd like to, to highlight uh, is that we continue to track the uh, case rates by vaccination status, um, as has been seen in other jurisdictions. And as we've reported previously, um, the case rates are higher for those individuals who are not vaccinated. Um, we've noticed within our county some elevated, um, some increases in case rates for unvaccinated individuals. We're going to continue tracking that. We know it's a much smaller population than our vaccinated individuals in our county. But again, we, we share this data, hoping to uh, convince those individuals who are not vaccinated that it's still worth their efforts to go out and get vaccinated even at this time. Um, again, just reporting on our, our uh, deaths related to COVID-19, um, we continue to see uh, those trends hold steady. Uh, we'd like to see those start to come down, but these are uh, uh, at about a, a, a fatality per day with a COVID diagnosis. These are still much higher um, than other respiratory illnesses that uh, rates that we've seen in our county. So this is why COVID is still a, a significant concern to us. Um, these are um, predominantly happening with individuals who are older and individuals with underlying conditions, um, as well as higher rates with individuals who are unvaccinated. Our uh, booster rates continue to go up. Uh, we'll, we'll soon hopefully have updated graphics uh, helping us parse out the 
uh, the new bivalent booster, which for some people is a, a first booster, some people a second, and some people um, uh, over 50 or, or underlying conditions, it may be their third booster. Um, in any event, it doesn't matter what order it is. Um, that This is the recommended shot to have. If you have not had the bivalent booster, it's recommended for everyone who's completed their first two shots. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Kimberly Townsend, to talk to us about our current status with our MPOX response. Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon. Uh, looking at our map of the United States cases of MPOX, you can see we have just over 26,000 cases. And in the state of Maryland, we are still seeing some new cases, um, bringing us to 662 cases. Uh, looking at our seven-day daily average, uh, it's encouraging to see that we continue to see a downward trend of cases nationwide, uh, which is we'll continue to monitor and continue our mitigation strategies uh, in hopes that uh, this trend will continue. We have had 81 cases identified in our county as of uh, September 30th, and uh, we have just above 2,000 of our Maryland residents vaccinated for our NPOX done by Department of Health and Human Services, which for, accounts for just about 30% of all vaccinations done in the state of Maryland. Uh, you can see here uh, in terms of our cases and communities that have been affected, uh, we still have some outreach that we're going to do to reach out to those communities um, that still need to come out and get vaccinated. Uh, we continue to work with community partners. We have increased our uh, capacity and have started offering vaccinations at our upcounty site in Germantown. And uh, we also plan to have some outreach via our third in the series of town halls scheduled for Monday evening. So in terms of updates, we continue to provide the vaccines to our priority one, two, and three groups uh, by providing vaccines to those that are eligible for post-exposure vaccination um, as well as pre-exposure uh, preventive vaccination. So um, very few updates for MPOX this week. We just want to continue to encourage those uh, that are eligible to go to our pre-registration site and uh, we are reaching out to those that are on that list to invite them in for vaccination. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lorna. Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. Uh, Dr. Stoddard, do you have any opening remarks today? Yeah, I just want uh, two quick uh, comments. Uh, first off, we did have a meeting with our municipal partners on COVID-19 and one of them brought up the the inquiry that they've received from the public, which is largely, well, COVID cases seem to be coming down right now. There aren't a lot of hospitalizations. Should we really get the bivalent vaccine? And the message is extremely clear. The reason why we keep numbers lower in Montgomery County is because we're so heavily vaccinated. It is, it is not a steady state expectation that that will maintain. It is up to all of us to continue to get our vaccinations. Uh, do not wait till you see a surge in cases or hospitalizations to go out and get your vaccine dose now. Do it now. It's extremely important. You may be helping to prevent the infection in your own household. Uh, vaccination absolutely does reduce the probability of infection. It does not prevent infection, but it does, however, significantly reduce your chances of having a severe case that results in hospitalization or death. Uh, so I just want to say that first off. Also wanted to provide an update off for Maryland, Maryland Task Force One, the, the fire EMS team that is deployed down to Florida right now. They remain on the ground. Uh, and I believe that their plan is to actually move over to Pine Island today. If you haven't been tracking it, they had to rebuild the bridge to connecting to the island. They have been doing a large number of uh, search and rest, sec primary and secondary searches of, of buildings. Uh, they are working with human remains dogs and, and um, are working in coordination with both the state of Florida as well as other teams in the region to identify those those people who are still being considered missing. And so that, that work continues um, and um, I think they're actually operating, uh, the play, base of operations is, is actually JetBlue Stadium that they're operating out of. So they're coordinating with teams and dispatching out of there, but uh, sounds like Pine Island is on the 
is where they're at today. So that's the current plan. We expect to have another update later this evening, and we'll continue to provide updates about the team's well-being and, and their, their work in Florida as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Uh, me members of the media, reporters, this is a time for questions regarding public health and uh, any other questions. So use the chat and we'll wait a second because I do not see any questions. Okay, I, I see that Kate Amara from WBA, WBAL has uh, questions, yes or not? Yes, I do. I do okay. have a question. It's not about health though, is that all right? That's fine, go ahead. Okay, County Executive, uh, I'm also in Annapolis today. I um, I attended the appeals court uh, hearing on the Housing Opportunities Commission um, and the uh, over the, the apartment complex property off River Road. And I think a big question that a lot of people have is if this is the, the county's housing agency, why can't the county control what is being done? Why can't the county make them uh, reinsure the, the remains or stop a sale altogether or force the HOC to uh, to sit down and talk with this group. Can can you explain that? Mr. County Executive, please unmute. You need to unmute. I can't do it because it's not the county's agency. They're a kind of quasi-independent group that get most of their funding outside the county. We do provide funding to them but we don't have any authority over them. I have no authority over them. Um, but I will say, this is a really complicated case. I don't know what the, I don't know what's been ruled yet today. So if you know what's been ruled, you're ahead of me. But I don't know. I have tried to put them, and I have gotten them at a table before, with folks from you know from the Cemetery Coalition. Um, the ask from the cemetery coalition changes. You know, we I think I've supported memorialization from the beginning. I don't think uh, they would object to memorialization. I don't believe anything should be built in the future over lots 175 and 177, which are the driveway there, but they're not the entirety of the property. Um, selling it wouldn't you know? They obviously they bought it. They they are the last recipient in a chain. Of several sales. So this has obviously been going on since the 50s um, and the 60s when these bodies were disinterred. Nobody knows for sure what's under there. We've had, and I heard it from, you know, witnesses who, you know, are part of the church who said that when they witnessed the excavation of the site, that when a body was found, the bell was rung and something was scooped up and where it got disposed of People honestly don't know, and I don't know whether they were put up against the side of the, the what became the hill that's the driveway now, or whether the owner at the time, and we're talking over 50 years ago, or whether the owner at the time hauled them off and dumped them someplace. Nobody knows the answer to that. I have offered to go in and do a ground penetrating radar study that would allow us to do to determine what's underneath there. And I was told not to do it. Um, so I didn't do it. And I would encourage HOC, but the only way you're gonna resolve what's under there is if you can start with a ground penetrating radar study and then follow up with whatever else you need to do after you look at the ground to, to verify or not verify what's there or what's not there today. But in my mind, whether or not any of the bodies remain, whether or not they've all been piled in, to, uh, you know, against the roadway and everything has been heaped over them. I don't think anybody should build on that. It, it was a cemetery. The fact that we desecrated it, or that we didn't do it, but the builder did, did it and they didn't follow the law at the time, doesn't change the fact that, well, you messed it up and so we shouldn't we shouldn't be concerned about what happens there. If, if it was my power, I would simply say there will be no construction on that site, whether or not you transfer it, which I honestly don't care about. I don't care who owns it. I do care what happens on, on the cemetery portion of that property. And I would do whatever I can do to ensure that nobody builds on it and that it, that it gets memorialized. And, you know, it's complicated. I assume you've been out to the site. So you know that the only access to the parking of the building is by driving down that driveway. There are green spaces there that could be memorialized. It's possible to narrow the driveway 
to provide more space that would be memorialized and the lower park can certainly be memorialized and the part that park and planning has could be memorialized. So I am totally in favor of doing that. Um, and we, if we can get an agreement to focus on memorialization, we can proceed having those conversations. And I, I'm in favor of basically, and I've written to park and planning and told them, I think this ought to be handled by an independent group of people, not, not exclusively this one church either, because people who are buried there come from many different churches in Montgomery County and also from the District of Columbia. And the initial bodies that were put in the cemetery were transferred from a cemetery that belonged to the same group in D.C., where they were basically booted out of their cemetery there, and they bought the property in about 1911 or 1912 and put the initial bodies from D.C into the cemetery as well. So there are a lot of African-American stakeholders, you know, who I think need to be engaged in how we memorialize the place. But I completely agree with memorialization. This is my decision. I would have, if I could have made this decision, I would have done it a long time ago. Thank you, that does answer my question. I think that it sounds like it's a, a, county, a county agency, but it's quasi public, so you don't control it. That's that's the question I had, and you answered it. Thank you so much, County Executive. Thank you. I, I just think it's an important story because it bothers me when people say we don't know if there's a cemetery. We know damn well there's a, there was a cemetery there. It's, it shows up in uh, magazines from the 1930s. It shows up in land records. So anybody, you know, trying to create some confusion about whether or not there's a cemetery there or was a cemetery there is just engaging in pretty gross deception. It's there. The question is, how do we memorialize it now? Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions from the members of the media? Please use the chat to um, request your space for questioning, for questions. Any more questions, members of the media? I'll wait another second. If not, we say goodbye. <laughs> okay. Okay. Not in the chat. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, have a great and safe afternoon and we'll see you again. Wait, they tell me to wait for a second. Well, well I tried typing in. I don't know why. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I do you have questions? Go ahead, Kate. Go ahead. I didn't think, I didn't think it was possible for you to be here and not have questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I do have a question about the situation involving MCPS school bus contract and the um, state uh, study, uh, the audit uh, that shows um, some evidence of uh, mishandling of funds. Uh, I know that the school system says it's still under investigation. The uh, state's attorney's office obviously can't do anything until the police finish right. their investigation. But are you concerned with the findings so far? We're talking about accusations that well, a finding according to this audit that $1.2 million was handled by an outside vendor and that up to $600,000 uh, was being used. Uh, no one... Uh, inside a legal setting has used the term embezzlement, but it certainly arouses a lot of concern. What are your thoughts on this? And, and do you have concerns about the current fleet, um, uh, the electric fleet that they've uh, uh, done a deal with Highland Electric? I don't have a concern about the fleet. And, you know, they put the, the contract out for bid, and I did think that uh, this is the best way for us to finance these projects. This other stuff... I mean, I haven't, asked, I haven't even had a chance to read the report, so I kind of saw a top line about some of the findings. Yeah, the, the findings concern me. You know, there shouldn't be unaccountable fun, unaccounted for funds or unaccounted expenditures, and I expect there to be a full investigation, and whatever comes out of the investigation, whatever actions they take, I'm going to support. Um, and this needs to be, you know, a learning lesson about how contracts are handled and managed and they certainly need to take a dive into it to make sure you can't do whatever whatever led them to be able to do the things that are accused 
they need to make sure that they make structural changes or policy changes that this whatever happened here can't be replicated again. Right. Now, the audit was broader than the Transportation Department. It found also that the school system um, failed to uh, check their um, accounts and inspect construction uh, on, on projects. Again, your concerns, and are you talking to the superintendent about this sort of thing? Well, I will, but this is all stuff that's new. I talked to the superintendent at the beginning of the week before this stuff, at least before I saw this. And so, you know, I will talk to her. We have, like, we meet three times a month now, give you an idea of how much we're talking to each other. So um, I will ask these questions because they're important questions. Um, it's, if they're not inspecting things and not getting what they're supposed to get, I mean, the, I think, again, since I haven't read the audit, I don't know whether they simply failed to inspect and the school system got what they wanted and what they paid for, or they failed to inspect and the school system got less than what it paid for and did or got something that wasn't functioning correctly. I don't know the answer to that. And that, you know, gets to the magnitude of, you know, how severe this was. But I don't know it yet. I don't know the answers yet, but I'm going to find out the answers, at least as much has been has been made public so far and as much as the as far as the investigations have gone. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, my internet is unstable. It's uh, freezing right now. <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, you can. This is yeah. wonderful. So it came back for a moment. I lost all of you. My apologies. Any more questions from members of the media? Going once. I'll do a quick follow up on the shots. Okay. Go um, ahead, Kate. Go I ahead. Did, Dr. Stoddard, you were very, you know, clear and, and uh, Dr. Bridges as well on get the shots again, because that's why a lot of people look at, should I get the flu? And I, I know you're not in the business of handing out medical advice, but is it considered standard practice for a person to get their flu and their bivalent at the same time? What do you advise on that? Or what is the advice from the CDC on that? We're both shaking our heads. The absolute, the absolute answer, Kate, is yes. Um, our team has worked with our clinical team as well, and uh, Ms. Thompson, who's also a nurse um, and has administered and leads our communicable disease and epidemiology team. So last year we were recommending the same thing. You can receive your um, COVID vaccination and your flu shot at the same time. In most spaces, we've made them available, but we do have. Uh, uh, community clinics where you could come in and if it's a community clinic at Dennis Avenue, you can come in side, get your uh, uh, COVID booster and go outside to the Kaiser Permanente van who supports us with our community vaccination um, um, uh, flu shots. You go outside and get one. Um, you can get it uh, in the same arm based on the <coughs> CDC recommendation. You can get it uh, two to three inches above or below the other, you can get it in different arms. So that's the that's the recommendation. But we also encourage anyone who's considering uh, getting a, a, a vaccine at the same time, as always, which is our standard practice, to consult their primary care uh, provider. Dr. Stoddard, you were going to say something else. Yeah, I think you got to it. Just summarize, separated by two inches and zero days is perfectly reasonable. And I'll just throw in that I got mine one day apart because the, where I got my flu shot, they didn't have a vaccine available. The next day, I went into Giant. I got my other shot. I got them in the same arm. Uh, and I can personally attest that I had no pain, no effects the next day. I know that's not true for everybody. So I can't say, hey, my experience is everybody's experience. But I can at least say my experience was no problem with either shot um, after the, from the moment I got it till two weeks later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Any more questions from members of the media? No more questions this afternoon. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, 
Thank you, Mr. County Executive, for joining us remotely today as well from Annapolis, correct? Yep. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Have a great and safe afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Bye, Sahali. May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. In this episode, we visit a few businesses in the county that are making great strides.